we might get started. So um, welcome everyone. So today is a bit of a, a mixed session in a sense that some of you guys are attending that particular training session as part of your first year course, HDI Essentials. For you who are commencing your candidature in the Faculty of Medicine and Health. And then we've got additional guests who are attending this session today to actually benefit from Gordana's with them regarding the services that SAS Central is actually providing. I'm joining this meeting from uh, Gadigal and Bidigal land today, and I want to pay my respect to all the elders past and present and extend that respect to all emerging leaders and all indigenous people with us this morning. So as I said, today is a bit is a mixed session. So for those of you guys who are attending this session as part of HGI Essentials, just as a reminder, you will have uh, a post workshop uh, task to complete. Uh, you can find that task on Moodle. And if you didn't manage to actually attend that session live, you can still find the recordings on Moodle and you will find all the links regarding the templates that you will need to fill in as well as the Turnitin link that you will need to use to submit your task. So without any further ado, I will leave the floor to Gordana. Thanks again for being with us today, Gordana. Take it away. Thank you, David. Okay, so I am Gordana. I'm from Stats Central. Stats Central is the statistical consulting unit internally at UNSW. And there's uh, a bunch of us consultant statisticians, so there's seven of us. And most of you will have access to us. So if you're internal to UNSW, if you're a HDR student or a undergraduate, uh, like ILP students often have access to us in the partner schools. Um, Definitely staff have access to us. So we are here to help anyone with their study design and their analysis that's at UNSW. And um, so this is kind of a, an introductory seminar to study design. I try to make it as practical as possible so that you can go away and sort of um, use the skills in here to, to help design your own study. But it's always a good idea to also talk to a statistician if you're designing a study. Um, and given you have access to all of us, we're very happy to help you with this. Um, so I'll start kind of slow um, doing, oh, doing some, um, some basic uh, concepts in statistics, uh, the difference between populations and samples, uh, confounding, dependence, um, some observational versus manipulative experiments. Um, this is good stuff to go over. And if you're not, if it's been a while since you've done any research, uh, it's a good uh, reminder, or if it's your first time doing research, it's a good things to know. And then I'll, I'll take you through some um, more sort of practical things, how, to, how you might do randomization, how you might think about and calculate sample sizes, and uh, a couple of tricks about sample size as well. Okay, so um, I, I'll do the examples um, both in R, R is a statistical package that many people use, um, or I will also do them using Excel and GPower. Um, GPower is a sample size um, um, a sample size software, and I will post this link now in the chat in case anyone wants to download GPower so that we you can play along a bit later on so that we don't get too too tired. Okay, so the first and most important thing you need for designing a study is a research question. It needs to be specific. It needs to um, answer a lot of things. Um, so what, what you need is you need to know what your study population is. Is it all people? Is it people in New South Wales? Is it people with a particular disease? Is it um, kangaroos? Is it what, what is your study population? And then is it is it, you know, in, in time? So um, is, is it in the last 10 years or in this year and in New South Wales. So these are all really important things to think about. So who, who do you want to your study to apply to? That is your study population and that is the population that you want to take a sample from. Um, what's the response? So what are you interested in? Are you interested in these people's survival or the, um, the abundance of the kangaroos? What is the, the thing that you're most interested in? What are the predictors? So these are independent variables. So um, 
maybe you're interested in survival, but relative to how, you know, a treatment, you, know, you want to know if a treatment improves survival, or um, you want to know how uh, the abundance of kangaroos um, is relative to water availability. So those are your independent variables. And then what, what's the relationship between those? So you would have some hypothesis ahead of time, usually, about what's the relationship between these things. So you need to write all this down very specifically. And if you do that, then you have a good question that you can then plan a study based upon. And vague questions are very difficult to answer. Um, so um, starting with a, a small set of, of uh, particular questions is really important. Um, and then, so, a lot of people get confused about sort of what we're doing when we're looking at a sample. So I asked about, um, I talked about a population, so that's on the right here, um, maybe uh, uh, humans, people in New South Wales or something like that. So let's say it's people in New South Wales. I'm interested in this population of people. There's more than just this many, there's lots and lots of people. And what I want to know is how, what the prevalence in this case is of allergies. So people, the, the, the cream people have allergies, the blue people don't have allergies. No, other way around, blue people have allergies. And so that's what I'm interested in, in the whole population. I don't know exactly how, what proportion of people, what's the prevalence. But I don't have the whole population. What I have is a sample on the left. And so I'm never going to know the exact prevalence in the population, but I can know the exact prevalence in my sample, but that's not what I'm interested in. The sample prevalence is never what I'm interested in. It's just how I try to get an idea of the prevalence in the population. So here the sample proportion in my very small sample is 0.5. So that's my P hat. Hats mean that's a sample. Uh, thing, uh, a sample uh, statistic. But what, what does that tell me about my population prevalence? Well, that doesn't mean that my population prevalence is 0.5. Because I have a small sample, actually, what it tells me is that my population prevalence is somewhere between 0.15 and 15% so and 85%. So a very big range of prevalences are consistent with my sample. So that's what my sample tells me. And we're never interested in this number here. We're always interested in the true uh, population. So, so it could look like this. So we, we might have a population that's half half, but this sample is also consistent with a population that has mostly people with allergies because it can go up to as much as 85 based on our sample. So that's the important thing to remember. And then the, the population here, um, I just wanted to put in a slide about what I mean by population because it's a commonly used word in, in normal things. In, in statistics, oops, in statistics, um, it's kind of the, the, the population is, is like where you draw your sample from, like the collection of all possible um, observations. So I want to know about everyone in New South Wales. I can't list everyone. I can't sample everyone in New South Wales, but my sample will come from New South Wales and I want to, um, I want to infer things about them. Now, the characteristics of populations are called parameters. Um, for example, the population mean is a parameter or the population proportion, like in the last example. And then the sample is just a, a subset of the population. So we, we're, we're sampling from the population um, and the, the, the sample is what we've observed. So we haven't observed the entire population, but we have observed our sample. And then the characteristics of the sample are called statistics. So the word statistics actually comes from this. It means a characteristic of a sample. For example, the sample mean or the sample proportion in the last example. And so you need to remember at any point when you're looking at your um, sample, you know, you find there's differences in your sample. That doesn't mean that there are differences in the population because we, we have uncertainty. We don't know what is it going on in the whole population because we only have a small sample. So any statistic of a sample always differs from the true population parameter. I should at this point pause for a second and say I really like questions as I go along. And so um, please ask questions. You can do so in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, I think David will keep an eye out for me for questions. Oh, David, no. please feel free to interrupt me if there are questions um, from the audience as well. 
if anything is unclear, or, or David, if you find something unclear, feel free to ask. Uh, Corin um, asks if we can copy. Absolutely, we, you will have a copy of these slides. Okay. And if I if I might add add something to that, if it's part of HDI Essentials, you will get a copy uploaded onto Moodle, so you can readily access it. If you are not part of HDI Essentials, then I don't know. We uh -huh. have a list of invite you know, of guests. So uh, on our website, we have all of the slides and um, recordings of our seminars. So if you go to the Stat Central website and look at the monthly seminars, you'll be able to find it there sometime today. Excellent. Okay. All right, confounding. So confounding means that um, the differences that are that we think might be due to either experimental treatments or predictors, independent variables, can't be separated from other things that might be causing observed differences. So here is an example, and I'm going to need you to play along. I hope there, there are a bunch of people in this meeting, so I want to see uh, uh, at least some people in the chat talking to me. Um, so you measure the height of children you go to a school, you measure the height of all the children or a bunch of the children and their maths ability. So you give them a simple maths test. And you find that the taller children are better at maths. This is true. This is absolutely what would happen if you went to a school and measured a bunch of kids' maths ability and also their height. So what I want to know is what is the confounding variable? Yeah, okay. So a few people have been brave and have said that age is the confounding uh, variable because taller means older. So exactly right. So I measured the height, but height is kind of like, is it's associated with age. Older kids are taller. So it's not really that taller children are better at maths. It's that older children are better at maths, but I haven't measured their age. So I, it looks like height is associated with maths ability. Um, so that's a confounding variable. I could control for age and controlling for age would mean that if uh, two children are the same age, but different heights, would, would their maths ability differ? And I would bet that it wouldn't. I don't think height is very associated with, um, with age. Sorry, with math stability. So, um, so that's that's kind of the idea of confounding. This is an example I tend to use because it's very familiar to us, and people can kind of guess what um, what happens. Oh, some people have other ideas. Ideas, yeah. So there's malnutrition. That could be a thing. Um, uh, and also study time. Yeah, so study time is associated with age. How long you've been able to study is is an age thing. Yeah. So. Um, so this is a really familiar example to all of us. What you need to, what, what we have to remember when we're doing studies, or when we're when we're conducting research, is we're, we're conducting research because we don't know that much about what the 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 field that we're researching. That's why we're doing the we're collecting data to find things out, and so. You can't between height and maths ability and you don't know anything about humans, you're an alien, you might conclude that um, height is related to maths ability because it doesn't occur to you to measure age. And that's kind of how we are. We're aliens when we do research. And so you have to always think about confounding and what could be confounding things. So what can we do about confounding? Well, we can conduct manipulative experiments. Talk about that a lot later on. Um, this is like gold standard, you know, this is what, what this means is in medicine, you call manipulative experiments, uh, randomized clinical trials. So this can completely remove the effects of confounding and you can show causation. So that's really great, uh, not always possible. And so in observational studies where you don't manipulate um, the, um, the environment, then you can control for confounding variables. Um, this can work, but for it to work, you have to measure all possible confounders. So we have to first think about what all the possible confounders are, then measure them. And because of this, because we never know, we, we can never know that we've found all the possible confounders, it makes it impossible to show causation. You can kind of do a little bit better um, than not controlling, but you still can't show causation with observational studies. Gordana, uh, there is a yes. question from Ooh. that then, and what's your take on multivariable regression versus propensity scores for handling conf con confounders? Sorry. Um, they're similar um, 
they're similar sort of things. Um, they both kind of try to do the same job. I tend to control for things like multivariable regression controls for things. So that's my preferred um, method because it's more flexible. So you can um, control for linear relationship, but also nonlinear relationships. And each variable is controlled for independently. But there's nothing wrong with also doing other other ways of controlling for things. So it depends a little bit on the on the question. OK, thank you. Good question. OK, so what are manipulative experiments or RCTs? You need three things. So you need controls, you need replication and you need randomization. So why do you need these things? Well, lots of things can influence the outcome of an experiment. You can have a pandemic, you can, the weather changes, anything that happens over the passage of time can influence an, an experiment. And these things are not under your control. So you do need something that you can control so that you know what would happen if not for the manipulation or for the treatment. So we want to have a group of people or a group of subjects that have not undergone the treatment so that we that those people will also change over time, but not in the same way, hopefully, as the people undergoing the treatment. And then we can compare the controls to the treatment. If we don't have a control, we are comparing the treatment to uh, no change, but no change might not be what would have happened without the treatment. So we need controls. We also need replication. Um, so that we can attribute differences between treatments to the treatment rather than innate differences. I'll talk about this a little bit more later. And then randomization is kind of a magic um, thing that allows you to overcome confounding. So it can con it's, it's a way to control for all possible confounding variables. Um, so when you randomize, you, you essentially don't need to control for anything. So, um, oh, okay, so controls. So controls basically mean that, um, you know, you have, um, you have a, a comparison group who is as similar as possible to your treatment group um, in every way except for the treatment that you're, you're interested in or the intervention that you're interested in. So in clinical trials, for example, people might receive a placebo because there's a placebo effect and you don't want to, you want to be able to account for that. Um, or you might give people usual treatment. Um, in, in microbiology, it might be unmodified cell lines. In ecology, it might be sites without any treatment applied. And so you want you want to have a control to compare to. It's really, really important. And a lot of studies um, a lot of people who are not experienced in study design skip this step and it's a really, really important step. It's completely vital. So even in observational trials, you still need to have uh, people in your study that are a comparison group, a control group. Um, yeah, so you want them to be as similar as possible in every way. Um, and also, um, if possible, certainly in clinical trials, you want to be um, blinded. So blinded means that the, um, the patient, uh, the physician, the researchers and anyone else in, involved in the study that is assessing outcomes should, be, should not know what the treatment allocation for that patient is. Um, oops, and so this this um, this is also really important. Um, it's very very common in 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 um, medicine. Blinding is like part of the, the how you plan a, a study in medicine, but it really could be much more common in in every um, in in all the other um, research fields um, where it is possible to blind. Um, okay, so questions. Please explain more about placebo effect. Ah, so the placebo effect. Um, what what happens is if you are a patient and you receive treatment from a doctor, even if that treatment is ineffective, you tend to feel better. Um, this is like a proven thing. People feel better because they've been given a treatment. Even even um, measurable things like your your um, 
like things you don't have control over, like your blood pressure and stuff, will improve just because you're getting a treatment, even if that treatment has absolutely no effect. Um, so what we need to do is we we need to see if there's an actual effect of the treatment or is it just the effect of a person receiving any kind of treatment and that's why we always um in at least in medicine give a placebo okay any more questions at this point i'm going very fast so feel free to ask questions and i'll slow down okay Dependence. So independence between, so independence is really important. A lot of statistical analyses um, require independence, so a t-test, linear model, anything that's not a mixed model essentially requires independence. So you need to, you need to know whether or not you have independence. And so um, what does it mean? Well, it's, it's easier to talk about dependence. So measurements from the same person tend to be more similar than measurements from different people. So if you measure one person twice, those measurements will be more similar than if you measure two different people. Um, measurements from the same hospital, say, or the same school or the same area are, are more similar than from different ones. Measurements closer in space or in time are more similar. These are types of dependence. So any measurements that are taken in your study that might have these attributes are not independent. So you have to think about dependence and you have to take it into account in both your experimental design and analysis. Um, and then dependence is, is also related to replication. Um, so I'll just explain that in the next um, slide. So here, is um, a study um, where I have a treatment in blue and a control in cream and um, I'm at a hospital. And so what does replication mean? So here I've got one person um, receiving the treatment and one person receiving the control. Now I might measure that person seven times and this person seven times, so I might have seven measurements that are labeled control and seven measurements that are labeled treatment. So I could, in theory, then do a t-test, but that would be the wrong thing to do because it, there's no replication. I have not replicated the treatment. So I have to replicate the treatment in order to be able to um, do a test. So this is not, a, and, and so that induces dependence. But there's no replication here. So what can I do? Well, I can replicate the treatment. So I can have multiple people that are um, in the treatment group and other multiple people that are in the control group. And even if they're at the same hospital, this is all dandy and good. That's no problem. What about, but I can have multiple people and still have no true replication. And so this looks like maybe like this. So you might have one hospital where, where everybody is in the control group and another hospital where everybody's in the treatment group. So you have, once again, when you write down your data, you might have 12 people in the treatment group and 12 people in the control group, and you might be able to do a t-test here and get a result. But that t-test is not valid because there is dependence. So it's not independent. And the reason is that there's any differences that you might find between the blue and the cream people might be because of the treatment. So it might be because blue is different from cream, but it might be that this hospital is different from this hospital. And so in general, anyone that going to this hospital is going to be just be different regardless of the treatment. So there's confounding, so there's no true replication here. So, um, how to fix that? Well, there are a couple of ways. Um, you can um, allocate the treatment within the hospital. This is good. Um, so here you've got some of each treatment in each hospital. So you do have still dependence. So the people within each hospital are dependent because they're in the same hospital, but we still have replication because um, we are replicating the treatment within the hospital. So it's kind of like we just have multiples of this one up here. So that's fine, we can do that. And the fact that we have two hospitals is not a problem. Or if you can't do that, 
if you have to allocate the treatment to an entire hospital, you can do that, but then you have to have many hospitals. So you have to replicate at the hospital level. So you have, I have here four blue hospitals and four cream hospitals. So this, these both have both dependence and replication. So they're, they're fine. Okay, questions about that? No. Okay, so um, observational studies. So we've talked that that the past the little few last slides were about um, manipulative experiments, um, but we can't always do manipulative experiments. Um, some reasons are ethical. For example, we can't randomize people to smoke or to do anything harmful to them. Um, often the cost is much bigger for a clinical trial or for a randomized experiment than when you use existing data. Um, or if you have rare outcomes, um, then it's often not a good idea to do a clinical trial because um, not, nobody in either group may actually have the outcome, so you won't have any data. And even when these are not the case, observational studies are a really good way to generate hypotheses um, in general. So a couple of types of observational studies that um, we can think about. Um, so this is kind of from, from um, from least to best, uh, a cross-sectional study um, means that you, you take observations at one time point for both the exposure or treatment and the outcome. So the outcome and the exposure are, are measured at the same time. So um, you might measure smoking, do you smoke, and do you have lung cancer at exactly the same time. These are fast and good, uh, fast and cheap and really good for hypothesis generation, but they have lots of bias problems. So you can think about that in the smoking example. It doesn't really matter whether a person is smoking right now in order to um, predict their cancer status right now. It matters whether they smoked in the past. Um, and, and often um, that will be the problem, but there are other lots of bias problems. So then you can do um, you, the, another kind of um, study is a case control study. These are almost exclusively in medicine. So basically what happens is um, you might have a disease that's rare um, and so you have you know a cohort of you have maybe like 30 people with this uh, rare disease and you want to know what are the um, what are the causes of that disease? So um, say that disease is lung cancer, um, you get a bunch of people with lung cancer, and then you find people that are similar to these patients um, in every way, in, in, in every possible way, in age and sex and things, other things. And then you have a look at the other variables that you're interested in, like for example, smoking, or is there a difference in the rates of smoking between these people that have lung cancer and these other similar people? And so that's a case control study. It's really good for rare outcomes, but bad for rare exposures. So if no one, if very few people smoked, then this wouldn't work because you might not get anyone smoking in either group. But there's a lot of biases that can occur, but they're still quite good. Um, and then the best kind of observational studies are sort of cohort, which can be either prospective or retrospective. And essentially in a cohort, you follow people over time. And so you follow people with and without an exposure, so people who do and don't smoke over time, and you see if they get lung cancer. That's the best kind of evidence of observational studies um, because it can estimate the temporal association between the exposure and the outcome, but they are the most expensive kind. Um, and they have lots of issues as well, like loss of follow-up. People will disappear from your study um, or they might change their exposure. People stop smoking, start smoking, and you have to deal with that somehow. So it, it, is, it, it does get difficult um, on, usually. Um, okay, so what about causal effects? So observational studies are a really good way to show associations between variables. So examples for smoking is associated with high risk of lung cancer. Um, but often people will conduct observational studies when they would rather have done a manipulative experiment, but you can't because of cost, ethics, and convenience. And if that's the case, that's usually because you're looking for a causal effect. You want to know if smoking causes lung cancer. Um, 
And so that's very different. Smoking is associated with lung cancer. It's a very different statement from smoking causes lung cancer because of confounding. And so can you do this with observational data? Well, you, you can't completely do it, but there are methods that can, uh, they're called causal inference methods, and they can um, help to do better with uh, observational data than you might when you're not using that, that method to get closer to something that might be a causal effect. Um, all of these methods make very strong assumptions. So you have to make sure that you are very clear about um, that. But with some assumptions, you can uh, account for some of the biases associated with this data. So some of the types of things that you can do are called, there's target trials, um, DAGs, um, uh, regression type methods like instrumental variables, difference in difference, G methods, inverse probability weighting, all these things <coughs> are causal methods. Sorry, I just need to have a drink. Okay, so the, the important thing is um, these are really hard. I don't know how to do all of them. Nobody in Stat Central knows how to do all of them, but we're very happy to help you with them and we'll learn. But doing them on your own when you don't have a lot of experience is super hard. Um, and it's really important that you list all the assumptions of your methods. Um, good papers about these methods will have all the assumptions and they should be thought about in detail and checked where, they, where you can check them. Okay, so now we do a little bit of um, something a little bit uh, practical because it is practical study design. So we're going to randomize. So you're doing some sort of trial where you are allocating treatments and you want to do it randomly. Um, so why you do that? Because randomization um, can guarantee independence. Um, and um, so, and, and um, eliminate tr any um, confounding. And so it's a really there good thing a, to do. Sorry? Cordana. Yes. Cordana, there was a question from Dathan about if these causal analyses are based on assumptions, how then do they help assume causality? Yes, it's a good question. So they don't assume causality. Um, they make it so these causal analyses, the, the good thing about them is um, if you do know a little bit about how things work. So in humans, we might know a little bit about the biology and how things work and what's a plausible direction of causality. You can then apply this knowledge to improve your inference on how you know, smoking, whether or not smoking causes lung cancer. And you can do that in a very structured way. And then also listing your assumptions is a really good thing because you can say, I've made these assumptions. I think this is right. And then people reading your paper can be like, yeah, I agree with your assumptions. And I think that that, and, and then they can read your paper and, and have evidence that they believe on um, whether or not the ad effect is causal. So you can't say for sure that it's causal, but if you list all your assumptions and you're relatively confident in them, that gives others confidence that your conclusions might, like that, that the, the, the things that you say are causal might be causal. So I think that's, does that make sense? Okay, so we're gonna, um, we're going to do some randomization. You can do it really easily in R. So you use the randomizer package um, in R. And all you need to do, so what we want to do is we have 12 subjects and we have three treatments and we just want to allocate these 12 subjects to these three treatments. Um, so how do we do that? We can use the complete RA function, complete random assignment. And all we have to do is tell them how many people how many subjects and the conditions. Um, so we've got A, B, and C. By default, it's going to do it um, in the same proportion. There are extra things in the complete RA function if you don't want it to do it in the same proportion, but we'll just assume that. And that's it. You just run this complete RA function. And so then we check. So if we do table of Z, it'll tell us how many 
um, subjects were allocated to each treatment and we can see that four were allocated to each treatment. So that's good. It's a good thing to know. And then um, we can look at the list of the allocations by just looking at Z or in this case I've looked at the first 10 subjects. So the first subject you recruit is going to be in treatment C, the second will be in A, the third will be in B and you've got your random allocation of subjects. So that's um, using R. Um, Oh yeah, so here is if, if you wanted to randomize um, 100 subjects to two treatments, but this time you wanted more in the treatment group and less in the control group, you can just use the M each subject, the M each, um, uh, whatever that's called, variable. And that will say 60 in the treatment group, 40 in the control group. And then we can have a look and we see, yes, we did get 60 in the treatment group and 40 in the control group. And so the first person is going to be, the first two people are going to be in the treatment group. Then we'll have one control, another treatment and so on. So that um, allocates your subjects. We can also do this in Excel. Um, it's actually quite simple. So for those of you not who are not really R people, um, this is basically what you do. So you say, oh, I'm going to do the 12 subjects because it's easier. So if I have uh, 12 subjects, so I'm just going to put subject in here and I'm going to just number them 1 to 12. To do this, all I do is put 1 and 2. And then if I highlight both 1 and 2 and hover over this corner and pull it down, you'll see that it'll just keep going to 12. So that gives me all my subjects. And then I want um, group. And there I have three groups, which are A, B, and C. So those are my groups, um, but I need four lots of A, four lots of B, and four lots of C. Um, and all I need to do actually is um, highlight these three together and then just hover over this corner and trip and double click and it will fill it just down to here. So um, Excel can do this sort of stuff. OK, so then so we've got um, we've got 12 subjects and we've got uh, four A's and four B's and four C's. So we need that, but um, we want to now randomly allocate this, the, the group to the subject. And so we need a third column and we're going to call that random. And here we're going to get um, Excel to generate us a random number. So what we do is we type equals rand, open bracket, close bracket, and then enter. It'll just give us a number. I'm going to just highlight this cell and double click on the corner again. And that will give us one random number for each of these. So this will always be between zero and one. We don't really care what these random numbers are. We're just going to use them um, to sort the groups. So what we're going to do is highlight B and C, and then we're going to find the, the um, sort uh, thing here, the sort little button, and go to filter. No, I'm not going to go to filter. Undo, undo. Sorry. What I want is custom sort, and I want to sort by random. That's all I want to do. And then uh, that will sort this uh, randomly, and then I just need to delete this column because it's going to confuse me later on. Um, so you can see now it's in a random order. So it is actually ABC to start with. That's interesting. Um, but then um, so the first subject is in A, second is in B, third is in C, the fourth is in B again, fifth is in A, and so on. So you have a randomization list for you. There's a question. Uh, is there a similar randomization for starter SAS? I don't assess, I don't actually know, to be honest. Um, I might have to check that. Um, uh, probably. For SAS, I don't know about starter. I think probably for starter as well. SPSS, I don't think has a randomization, but the others I think would do. Um, you can you can ask us uh, if you want to email us. We, we'll try and help you with that. Okay. All right. So that's I've gone through all of those. Okay. So um, so that's how you do randomization. 
if you want to do it on your own, you can also, if you have a more complex randomization, you can always just ask us and we'll very happily provide a randomization list. Um, okay, so so we need we need controls. Um, we need replication. We need um, what was the third one? Controls, replication, independence. Somebody has to tell me what the third one was. Um, but at some point, we're going to have to decide what it, our sample size is, how many subjects we're going to collect data for. Sometimes we don't decide. Sometimes the budget decides. Um, so you have a budget for 30 patients, and that's what you're going to collect. Um, but other times, you do need to decide. And even if you have a budget for 30 patients, it's worthwhile Replication, thank you, that was the one I forgot. Um, um, yes, so even if you do have only a budget for 30 patients, it's a good idea to do sample size analysis because it will tell you how likely your experiment is to fail. So you don't really want to spend your money on 30 patients if you're very unlikely to get a result given how much variability and the effect size that you're looking for. So it's usually a good, good idea to think about sample size analysis. Okay, so what do we need for sample size analysis? Quite a lot. It's not an easy thing. Uh, and you, the researcher, needs to do a lot of the work. So um, what we need is we need an estimate of the variation um, in whatever you're measuring, your outcome. And we need to know what uh, an appropriate effect size is. So, um, to, so what we do is a sample size analysis Basically, the aim of a study is to detect an effect if one is present. Um, and failure to do so is called type 2 error or false negative. So um, if there is an effect in the population, we want to be able to get a small p-value. And there's no point running an experiment if you have no, no chance of doing that. So, um, so you have to get estimates for these two things. The best way to estimate variability is to conduct a pilot study. Obviously, that's not always possible. So it's also really good to look in the literature. If the literature often in table one, it'll have like the control and the treatment group and it'll have the outcome with a standard deviation. That's the thing you need um, to, to figure out variability. The effect size is more tricky because you have you get to decide. So this is the magnitude of the effect that you're hoping to detect. So if you think about a simple analysis where you'll have a treatment and a control group, what you'll what the effect size is is essentially how different the treatment and control group are going to be um, with respect to your outcome. And what we do is we don't want to take that from the literature because Often that's badly estimated in the literature. And so what you want to really do is think about what would be a clinically or biologically meaningful um, effect. Like what is worthwhile finding? You know, is, is a, um, so will a difference in blood pressure by one, I always forget what this is. Um, if, 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 if the treatment and control group um, differ by one, that might not be very interesting, but if they differ by 10, then that's very important because then we would want to give people this treatment. So uh, you, should be, uh, you should be thinking on these terms, like of your study, what would be clinically meaningful um, for an effect size? Okay, so um, I'm not going to go through how to do this. Um, but there are notes here um, on, on how it's done. Um, OK, I'm not going to go through this because we're pretty close to the hour, but the notes will take you through it. But um, what I will talk about is, um, is this last section. Um, it's really, there, there's a couple of tricks that you can use to to improve your, your study design. And by improve study design, I mostly mean, um, like if you already have replication and con controls and randomization, you're doing really well. And so the really the only thing left is power. Like how likely are you to find um, the effect that you 
uh, trying to find, or conversely, how small a sample size can you get away with um, using? And so and one thing you can, sorry. Well, Anna, perhaps in line with that, there's just been a question in the chat. If the calculations mm -hmm. of appropriate sample size were not done prior to conducting the research, what's your view on retrospective power calculations? Uh, my view is don't do them. Um, they've been debunked. <laughs> they don't give you any extra information that's not already in your confidence interval, and they can be used inappropriately to justify, um, you know, things that happen. So my, yeah, my views don't do them. Good question though. Um, okay, so uh, stratification and blocking. I don't know what the difference is. I've looked in the literature and they seem to be used completely interchangeably. So I will just use them interchangeably and usually say blocking. Um, so if you randomly allocate your, your observations, that can lead to a high level of variation between units, and that might obscure the effects of the treatment of interest. So when you group units into blocks with similar attributes, for example, you group things by location or in time or by treating doctor or by hospital, um, that can explain some of the variation and it can lead to more precise estimates of what you're actually interested in. Um, sometimes blocking is unavoidable, so you might be sampling patients in hospitals. So hospital is going to be a blocking factor and there's nothing you can do about it. But even when blocking is avoidable, it's sometimes possible and desirable to create blocking units. So um, if you want better power or smaller sample size, the thing to do is to um, block within, sorry, to allocate treatments within blocks. So these are both, this is from like one of the earlier slides, these were both allowed sample sizes that had both replication and dependence. And dependence is very related to blocking. So both of these are okay, good, sam good uh, experimental designs. They meet the criteria that you need them to meet. However, um, if, if your blocks are quite different, if each hospital is quite different to every other hospital, the top design where you allocate treatments within blocks will have more power. And so you'll be able to have a smaller sample size using this design than using this design. Sometimes you have to use this design because the, the nature of your treatment might have to be applied to an entire hospital, but if it doesn't have to be, then it's much more um, efficient to use uh, allocate within blocks. Um, you do have to take blocking and stratification into account in your analysis using usually fixed or random effects. Um, what, are, what other kind of blocking are there? So this one is kind of like within hospital. Um, case control studies, oh, studies are a type of blocking. So because you're, you're, you have a case and you have a control who's very similar and they form a block and each one has the, the, the outcome and one doesn't. So they're a type of blocking. Um, you can also, an, an individual can be its own blocking factor. So we can, so for example, we can sometimes apply treatments sequentially to each individual or uh, change from baseline is also a really important easy way to, to apply this principle of blocking. And this is just uh, the, an example that I won't go through. Um, so, um, so basically what, what the things to keep in mind is to apply treatments within blocks if you can, um, or to do um, before and after measurements um, and calculate differences or control from baseline. So these are really easy ways to get a more efficient sample size. <clears throat> blocking isn't always worth it. Um, it depends on how similar your blocks are. So um, if your blocks are really similar, if every, so, so education, like schools are, you know, a blocking factor. In Scandinavian countries, most schools are pretty similar. They don't really have a lot of differentiation between schools. So blocking might actually not really be worth it in a Scandinavian country. But say in the US where the school you go to is really like, the, the schools are very different in quality, the, the blocking will have a big impact. So it depends how different your blocks are. If the blocks are very similar to one another, it might not be worth it to do. Um, 
you might want to do sample size for more complex um, analyses as well. Um, I, I showed you in the notes how to do a t-test. If you need to do thing this, um, you it's hard. Um, if you can talk to us about it, talk to us about it. We have good software to do that. We also have a course that we run in the beginning of every year on sample size um, analysis, which is just passed. Um, but yes, yeah, some of them can still be done in G power. But the other thing is sometimes your your um, sometimes you can reduce the main analysis to a t test. Sometimes you can think about your um, your more complex analysis and like say you are do you have three um, treatments, but your primary interest is only in the difference between two of them. Then you might still be able to use a t test for your sample size analysis. So that might be another thing to do. And I've uh, listed some uh, references and further reading. OK. So any questions at this point or about anything at all? You could ask me about the slides or about Sat Central, um, or you can ask David about the task if you're a HDR student. Um. What I might do actually, Gordana, I might actually share my screen fairly quickly yep. to show everyone if they don't know by now what's going to be expected. So basically, you can find on Moodle, you can see uh, the tab here or the toggle that's about Stat Central. So you will find here, so you've got the link to the workshop for today. You will find here the recording once it's been uploaded, as well as a presentation slides. For the moment, it's hidden from you guys. But here you can find all the templates. So you've got three different templates. You only need to complete one. The one that's actually the most relevant for your current project or your whole PhD, it really depends. And then you will need to actually upload the completed document by the 20th of April using the Turnity link here. So you will find that you've got some PDFs. You also have a Word document. Uh, and it's really a matter of actually uploading and completing the, the post-workshop assessment that actually matches the best your experimental setup. And that's it for me. And apart from a lot of praises for the quality of your presentation, I don't see any questions. Well, OK, thank you, everyone. Um, make sure to get in touch with Stat Central if you need help with sample, with study design or sample size or analysis. Um, you just go to our website and uh, it, there'll be links there. Yeah, and for those of you guys who are commencing candidates in the faculty, just a reminder, next week uh, we will have a workshop from careers at UNSW, so how to actually anticipate your next step in your career. Thanks again, guys, for attending, and I will see you all next week. Thanks again, Gordana. Yeah. Thanks, Gordana. Thanks, David. Hey, guys.